Let me also greet all of you. Yes, to say that what I, it is also a pleasure for me to share what I will share today with you because it helped me to reflect on something that just happened. I just came back from, from a trip in, in Colombia and preparing this presentation has been very useful. So please, if you don't understand anything or my English is not so clear, yes, you can let me know and Matiek, between Matiek and myself, we will manage so that this hour we can, we can share it together in the best way possible and enjoy all. So let me start by um, introducing you why I decided to divide this presentation in three parts. Uh, the first, well, this presentation is filled with duality in the sense that, um, well, everything is polarity. And so I want to tackle the first part of the presentation, uh, like the science part. So I will go more for all the external facts, all what our minds and visible world and the material world is um, more talking to us every day. And then in the second part, I will go to, to the part of what are the insights from the Kogi. And I will explain to you the Kogi is an indigenous community from Colombia. We'll give you more details about their cosmovision. And they are more related to the feminine part, to the internal part, to the invisible and the spirit. And why I wanted to, to structure the presentation like this, because I think that the only way possible for us to do any type of regenerative work is through the integration of these two parts. Now, Matthias was already talking about the inside and the outside, and that regenerative development is precisely cannot be done by only uh, working outside, but has a lot of internal work. And that's why this integration for me uh, has become very clear and key for continuing our more harmonious uh, living in this planet. So let's start by the science part, uh, more the external world that we see. And I just put here a few pictures only referring to what we are being bombarded by science nowadays. And by the media and the external world that comes through our senses. I decided to put pictures that are referring to environmental degradation, but of course not to say about all the social and conflicts and war conflicts that we are having nowadays. So um, yeah, our world seems to have a multi-dimensional crisis. And as uh, you saw in the previous presentation from Matiek, is very complex. So we cannot dare to say that this is due to climate change or this is due to whatever only one reason, because it's a multi-dimensional type of challenge that we are facing today. Um, from biodiversity loss to volcanoes eruptions, monoculture, droughts, fires. So it seems that science outside and all the media we have been somehow bombarded by the idea that um, our world our planet is going to hell and even worse we don't have a planet b what this this type of imagine uh, imagination or, or this type of subconscious uh, type of beliefs that we keep on carrying with all this news is that actually it fills up with anxiety and with a lot of um, so to say uh, frustration uh, what is going on in our lives and also with a lack of this urgency is making us not more intelligent but just acting um, without even planning on what could be the best way forward for this uh, alarming state of the planet. 
Science is also coming together, different scientists from the world, and they do this type of uh, reports. This is the Global Environmental Outlook Report. This is the sixth version in which scientists around the world, they bring their data, and they not only say the state of the world now, but they also set up scenarios for the future and tell us what could happen if we don't act quickly. So, for example, uh, food systems pollution. Scientists are telling us that, that antibiotic resistant infections are projected to become a major cause of death worldwide by 2050. That uh, about climate change, if we don't reduce our CO2 after 2050, we all know we will have this increase on one and or 1.5 degrees. Air pollution will cause premature deaths, six to seven million of, of people affecting more the vulnerable um, part of our societies. We have biodiversity loss everywhere, land degradation, which is um, directly affecting our talk today. Land degradation hotspots cover approximately 29% of land globally. Uh, which is about 3 billion people uh, around the world. More external facts and science, scientific facts are telling us that we most probably, we are living the sixth mass extinction, which is quite shocking because, uh, not only because of the extinction, but also because of the cause of extinction. Uh, meaning that the cause is not like the first one, it was the intense ice age. The second extinction was about the uh, drop, dropping of the oxygen level. Then we have volcanic activity leading to the third extinction. But the last one, the one in which we are living now, uh, according to scientists, they agree that we, Homo sapiens, we are the cause of this mass extinction. If we go to my, my topic, uh, I think Maciek said that I'm a forester and this is what I'm, my, my focus is more on. So this is a map where all our, our trees are globally distributed. We have like three trillion, which seems kind of abstract. Three trillion seems a lot. And they are mostly distributed in all these rainforest areas, boreal areas. But still, it seems that 15 billion trees are being cut down each year. And since our human civilizations, almost half of the trees that were there has disappeared. And here more facts about the loss of hectares uh, of, in the world since 1990 is like 178. These are big numbers that can mean nothing if we don't understand the consequences of this. It seems that in the last 30 years we are reverted, we have reverted a bit this uh, rapid decrease on deforestation and it seems that now we are decreasing but not so, let's say, more steady, not so deep. And this is taken by scientists as a good sign, or let's say something to be more optimistic to with. But, uh, and just to make you reflect, when we look at the statistics in this uh, global environmental outlook, so here these global forest assessments, they kind of compare what we are losing to what we are gaining. In the statistics, it is invisible that when we lose forests worldwide, uh, we can never replace it for a plantation of a forest. The forest, the old forest that is being lost and the functionality of this forest has so much value that in statistics it's not shown that this functionality of an ecosystem will cannot be put um, at the same level of a plantation forest or forestation that is done. 
somewhere in another place of the world. So we should be careful when we look at this decrease of deforestation in the world and the positive news. So for you getting a bit more into the forestry and why deforestation uh, for me uh, has been a, a, and is being a big uh, issue. Um, most of you knows already this cycle, but I just want to make it more evident. We are starting the number one at one o'clock. And we can imagine how when the tropical rainforest is disappearing from our tropic system, what it will start happening is that uh, yeah, it is start deforesting more and more, and it will decrease not only the trees in there, but also the whole ecosystems, humidity, and rainfall at local level. And this will start causing more water scarcity, droughts, and it will increase the desertification, not only in the places where the trees are disappearing, but in the neighborhood, neighborhood um, places now. So these droughts increase, and then we have this danger of wildfires that we are experiencing now more deeply, especially in southern parts of Europe, like Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece. All these forest fires are again causing more tree decline, and this tree decline then make a forest less resilient to absorb CO2 emissions. And with this, we can predict that then the CO2 will be not taken from our atmosphere and our local climate will start ch again changing and causing these impacts into our global climate's temperature. So that is an aggregated way of looking how the climate change and this cycle is being repeated every year and is being intensified every year. So it's um, not simple has some complexities and have a lot of local contextualization that being aggregated as a nested system have a global effect that we call nowadays climate change. But when we look at this, and if we go to the polarization that I talked at the beginning and this duality of looking at the external world, what could be the causes of deforestation we can see them as external causes and there are a lot of investigations uh, in this external scientists around the world now are making you know we have statistics uh, telling us what are the causes of deforestation in north america in europe it seems to be our forestry practices and also the wildfires that are affecting deforestation but for example, in uh, Latin America, deforestation is being driven by commodities like mining, but also other cask crops, soya and palm oil, uh, as well as in Asia. Uh, of, also in Africa and parts of Latin America, shifting agriculture practices, and um, this is one of the of the main external causes of deforestation. This is a raw picture of external causes around the world. And if we look then at this principle uh, that I, I, I think is interesting at this moment to bring the principle of correspondence, hermetic principle, in which if we think that what we see outside is a reflection of what we have inside, and this has been debated in, in uh, a lot in philosophy, metaphysics, um, then what are then the internal causes of all this environmental degradation? And this is to, for this presentation, these internal causes are, let's say, the, um, the ones that I have tried to tackle in the second and the third part. 
So internal causes of environmental degradation, deforestation, and all these multiple crises that I, I was showing you at the beginning. Uh, not sure if you know this uh, book, Regenerative Leadership, from Gil Sachin and Laura Storm. This is the first chapter, it's free online. And I like a lot of these representations, this very simple way of depicting what was what has been our journey of separation from nature. And what has been the internal causes uh, that has been leading ourselves to the moment, to the point in history in which we are now. According to, to them, uh, we have followed a very long journey of separation in which we were supposed before uh, in prehistoric time and before our religions, our science, our policies came into, we were supposed to have a time in which we, we were connected to nature and our both parts of our brain, our feminine and masculine sides, which doesn't mean men and women, but means our polarities within ourselves were united or at least were connected. Then after all these years in which we have been having, developing our religion systems, developing our uh, categorization systems, our way of learning and science, our policy systems, we have uh, been raising the separation from these connections to nature and the separations of our feminine and masculine sides within ourselves that led to the situation that we have today. This separation that is actually the internal cause of, um, of what we are living today. What is the way forward? And that's why this triangle that I put at the very beginning is the integration, is the reconnection. And the reconnection uh, will bring us to level reconnection with nature, and reconnection of our both parts, our feminine and our masculine part, the external, the internal. So it's all about conciliating again these polarities. We have seen the external problems, the external, um, yeah, what we are bombarded every day. We have also seen the causes, the external causes, internal causes, but what are the solutions that at this moment in the history, globally, uh, we are implementing? When we look at the solutions, we can see again the duality, the polarity. We have a lot of systems uh, that are implementing the solutions outside. No? We have on the one hand the Sustainable Development Goals, that are like big guidance to do external work on all our systems, no? political systems, economical systems. Then we also have even this decade is the United Nations decade of ecosystem restoration, in which, well, um, they are starting to compete uh, among many different organizations uh, who will restore what. And then at European level, we have the huge uh, event, which is the European Green Deal, in which it seems that externally we are all driving, we are all kind of getting the idea that we have to go green. Uh, green economy, European biodiversity strategy, and climate actions, and is all under the umbrella of the European Green Deal. All this green movement has been also backed up by science and articles like this one in, in, in the science magazine that were was telling that in, in these rough numbers, uh, planting 900 million hectares of forest on degraded land, around 1 trillion trees, will have the potential to restore 25% of the current atmospheric carbon. And giving also the message that this could be already enough to keep the world under the 1,5 uh, 
uh, degree Celsius temperatures. That is actually our commitment for the Paris Agreement. Articles like this are leading towards this type of um, green fever, global anxiety, uh, that is leading to a lot of, um, let's say, yeah, reforesting initiatives around the world. I'm not judging them, I'm just saying that this is an effect that is being amplifying itself and now is coming to gamification, like Ecosia, for example. Uh, we have also the bond challenge that is by 2030 they want to put 350 million hectares and we have two mega huge projects around the world the great the great green wheel world in africa and also in china which are um, yeah in africa for example is like 8000 kilometers long uh comprising 11 countries and they are just simply trying to um, make a green belt and try to stop the desert from growing so it seems that okay the world is collapsing we have this imagination this uh in uh, this view in our heads that we will disappear as of humankind and it seems that we are, uh, let's say, a bit naive, um, saying that, okay, the trees maybe, the forest maybe, will help us. And if we plant a lot, and if we regenerate the land, and I'm using here regeneration in the plain way in which we understand regenerating land and putting it green again, which is like the typical understanding of what regenerating is, which is not, and this is, has been explained by magic, and, I will go into it uh, deeper. So it's like, okay, the trees will they save us? And I would like you to take um, three minutes. I will be in silence to read this small letter to the forest. And yeah, this is just for you to to read it. So Matik, you can translate if anyone wants to take three minutes to read this letter and to reflect a moment. So Monica, do you want me to translate by reading in Polish? Yeah, this could be great. Okay, so it will not be silence and I will do it um, if I can. So, uh, list do lasu. Yeah. Witaj lesie. Potrzebujemy produkować odnawialną energię. Czy będzie ok, jeżeli skrócimy naszą rotację lasu i będziemy pozyskiwać więcej biomasy? Hej lesie, czy nie wiesz, że klimat się zmienia? Potrzebujemy, żebyś zwiększył swoją objętość, byś mógł pochłonąć więcej węgla. Hej lesie, właśnie odkryliśmy, że też potrafisz przechowywać węgiel po swojej śmierci w formie mebli i drewnianych budynków. Czy będzie ok, jeżeli zetniemy trochę więcej drzew? Drogi lesie, bardzo wiele dla nas znaczy ta, taki, jakim jesteś. Więc proszę, nigdy się nie zmieniaj. Zostań proszę dokładnie takim, jakim jesteś teraz. Lesie, nie współpracujesz z nami, byśmy osiągnęli nasze cele mieszkaniowe. Więc jesteśmy zmuszeni zmienić twój skład gatunkowy, i być może zmienić części ciebie, yy, tak żebyśmy mogli produkować więcej. Czy dla ciebie będzie to ok? Witaj, hello, yy, halo lesie. Yy, chcielibyśmy część ciebie wyłączyć z użytku i ograniczyć wstęp ludzi do tej części. Zaufaj nam. Będziesz szczęśliwszy bez nas. Nie chodzi o ciebie. Problem jest z nami. Nigdy sobie z tym nie poradzisz. Witaj lesie. Czy będzie ok, jeżeli zbudujemy ścieżki turystyczne w, w tobie? No i jeszcze ścieżki dla rowerów górskich. No i może jeszcze jedną ścieżkę do jazdy konnej. 
No i jeszcze, jeszcze kawałek pod pikniki, no i jeszcze schronisko przed deszczem. No i trochę parkingów. I to tylko tyle. Dzięki. Thank you. Thank you, Maciek. Ja? Um, I, I, I like a lot this letter to the forest in the sense that it's meaningful for us to reflect um that we are asking our environment uh, in this case is a forest but that we are relating to nature in in a way that is simply about covering our demands about covering and giving us what we need this kind of um childish relation is not a mature relation of mutuality giving and receiving and this is um in the second part uh, when i talk about the kogi i will go back to this point so these are the the external solutions are the solutions that i i just talked about so it's asking the forest to give us more is putting a lot of effort in the sustainable development goals and all is external but what are our internal solutions? If we miss this opportunity of having so much crisis in the planet um, to just make only a change outside, as always, to go just uh, so superficially trying to put uh, aid bands everywhere, we are missing the deep transformational potential of this period in which we are living in so few of the internal solutions that we have already we have the inner development goals and then i wanted to bring you to the progenitive development here and this uh matic has already introduced some of these uh, uh, books already the first one on top in direct war regenerative life and all these are from Carol Sanford, and then the other ones I already talked to you about. And Matic also talk about regenerative development and design, which is where I met Matic in the course of practitioners on regenerative development. And also I met uh, Magda and Emilia from Asada. And well, why I think regenerative development and design is bringing us to a point in which in which we start looking inside inside and inside to look outside so it's like mirroring and try to integrate both sides uh, so as Matic already highlighted regenerative development works on growing our capacities but capacities of the natural the cultural and the economic systems that are in our local context so that we can make it possible to co-create relationships that are um, yeah, between humans and nature that would enable us to live in more harmony with uh, each other. So Magic didn't go to the Tetra, so I'm, I'm happy about it. I will not go in depth because it took, I think, the whole course we did together. It was about understanding this Tetra framework and also applying it into different uh, case studies. So in, just briefly, to bring you in the philosophy of this uh, Tetra is that as Matthew also highlighted, the first point to start when we are going to work in a regenerative um, way is to look at the ground, to look at the local context and to understand what is the potential of the place, what is the motivation that is making you uh, working in this place and what this is the motivation, that is this arrow, that will lead you to the goals that wants to be unfolded, to the potential 
to the essence that has been also highlighted and spread by magic, this regenerative capability. And the how I'm, I'm going to do this is bringing me to the vertical axis here. What are the instruments that I need for doing this co-evolving mutualism? And here again, the word mutualism, meaning this giving and receiving among all the different actors, the land, and the resources that they have to make this, um, to unfold the potential of this place. And the last point on top in this uh, vertex is the direction, is the vocation of the places where we have to look always so that we ensure that our regenerative project is really targeting and is, is being, uh, so to say, in an iterative process of continuing learning and relearning and reflecting and being applied from the internal to the external. Yeah, so that is the tetrad in a nutshell. And the other uh, framework that has been a deep inspiration for me to look at uh, for my work and with my students here in the university is this one, the seven principles of regeneration. Matthias has also uh, developed the most important ones from the inner work. Here you see is divided into one triangle down is the inner work and one triangle up on top opposed to each other is the outer work. Unless we do the inner work of first developing the capacity to see holes and to see holes is to stop doing what we do in science very well, which is categorizing everything is instead of cutting down our reality we start connecting it and going beyond connection because holes is not connection is nestedness and that is very important this is a point five um once we are retrain our eyes internally to see holes again to see living systems, to, feed, to see how uh, all is nested. Now, Matthias put this human body there to show connectedness, not to show nestedness. Once we see, we are capable to see living systems again. This is training our eyes. We would be able to see essence, to see what is the uniqueness of this living system. What is the essence that is there to be unfolded through a potential? And all of this, like an iceberg, all of this is happen in the invisible. All of this is an inner work. And unless we do this inner work, this internal part, we would not be able to do the central part, which is the fourth one, which is the development. And to do the development, it starts inside, and we develop to do all the external work that will come later, which is this nestedness, nodal intervention, Matthias also explained, uh, which is this capacity to see what it is needed to spark the essence, to be unfolded, and to enable the potential to be there. Potential of places, potential of people, potentials of businesses, and the last part is the fields. And about this, I will talk more, tackling the cookie part. And the fields means, um, yeah, it's also energetic fields. It's like recognizing that it's all embedded into a, yeah, energe energetic fields in which we all interact to each other. And as much as we can hire up, the energy of those fields in which we are working, as much as this work will continue growing and evolving. So that is, in a nutshell again, the seven first principles of, of regeneration from Carol Sanford. And this is uh, the integration of uh, both no? into my research now on regenerative forestry and, and uh, yeah, it's an adaptation 
and is also what Mark has shown before. Uh, how can we go from human and forest being so decoupled that we are just simply cutting down, chopping down trees for getting timber, or we are just telling the forest what it needs to give us, doing conventional practice or green even initiatives or sustaining the status quo to move to this regenerative movement in which it implies that our inner dimensions, as I show you now with these two triangles, are aligned with the outer dimensions. And these are also the related with the three levels of work that Matek introduced you with these three concentric spheres. So I, I was uh, very happy to have the chance last year in September to go to Proshinko in Osada uh, and to, to work together on developing this tetrad with Matiek, with Magda and Emilia, and with all the, the people there. Uh, we have enjoyed quite a lot uh, the welcoming atmosphere and it was two intensive days of work. And yeah, we, we will see the next phase of this, of this work, hopefully soon. Are we doing okay? Because I want to go to the second part. If anyone here have a question and this first part could come, and when not, I continue with the COVID part. Let's continue because we have limited okay. time. So just, okay. yeah, let's go. Then um, the cooking. Let's go to the female part, to the internal, to the invisible and the spirit. And first, I will introduce you uh, the forest here in Eversbalde. I, I see it through my window now. Eversbalde is very close to Poland and our forests are very similar and this is what is surrounding the campus the forest campus and uh, my office and this is where i have walks before sitting down here to give presentation and to work with the students i go to this forest here this is one of my favorite places also because of this small house there this future where the students just stop there with professors and we do some practical work so after i used to work there so but this is what happened this is uh, a picture taken in the same place in april last year after uh, big storms um, here in the area and i remember in the day i took this picture i was super shocked and it was quite emotional to see those beautiful places chopped down uh, in this uh, dramatic state. So this is the house completely uh, disappeared, cannot be used anymore. And at this point, at this moment, I, I was even crying there and wondering why we as a foresters cannot prevent, we don't have the knowledge to prevent this type of episodes. Uh, who can help us? So it was really a call to, to yeah, asking for help. And at this few days later, one of former students, Stefan Safe, who is now um, the CEO of Tiny Food Forest, also working uh, with Matiek in Nosada, he wrote me an email and said, Monica, do you know the Kogi? They will come to, to Europe? and maybe you want to, to organize something in the university. And then at this moment, I thought, okay, my, my question has been partly answered. So the Kogis will come and I knew them and I respected a lot the wisdom. So the Kogis, these are the Kogis. This is an indigenous uh, community that is living in the north of Colombia in the Sierra Nevada in Santa Marta, it's a Caribbean coast. And this place is the highest mountain range close to, uh, to, the, to the sea. So they, we don't have exact numbers and data or, or, on when the, the Kogis 
start existing, but it seems like 4,000 years and they are still living in the same conditions and they were not conquered by the Spaniards. They were going up into the mountains where the Spaniard um, conquistadors came there. So the, this is why the Kogi are very special. They were not conquered and they were keeping their knowledge and their connections to nature as they were for 4,000 years. Um, today, there are around 10,000 Kogi, but they are mixed, well, not mixed, but there are all another two indigenous uh, communities called the Aruaco and the Wivas that are also living in this area. And they all have respect each other, collaborate to each other, and have the same kind of mindset. So the Kogi don't have writing, uh, they speak Kagapa and they transmit their cosmovisions orally. They have a very rich cosmovision and a special way of looking at the environment. So they think that they were born in Sierra Nevada and Sierra Nevada is like the center of the world, the heart of the world. And they see Sierra Nevada as a living system, as a human body. So the mountain is the head and the shoulders, and the lakes and the rivers are representing the heart, and also the rivers are the vein and the blood of what they call the big mother, Aluna, which is the creator, the mother uh, structure, and they are supposed to be the big brothers that have to take care of the mother of Aluna. And we are the small brothers. Uh, so this presentation, as I told you, is filled with duality. So also the Kogis understand the duality of the world and the polarities that is dividing the sun in two hemispheres in which we, once we have the light, and the uh, obscurity, we have the female, the male, we have the, the visible and the invisible. And the heart, uh, the, the earth, the planet is at the center. An important part of the cookies, apart from the fact that they has not been conquered, is that they, they have the mamos and the sagas, which are the spiritual leaders of of this community and they have a very strong spiritual formation since they are children they are brought into a cave 18 years in which this cave they are in darkness so they don't see in order to tune their senses with the external with let's say with internal um they tune their senses with the internal mother uh, voice, no? with the voice of the earth. So they are not polluted with their senses, with all the external world, but they go inside for 18 years. Uh, so they, it's quite special how they see the world. Um, this is one mamo. They used to have like here, kind of uh, hat that looks like an antenna and that is uh, what this mama said is the trees that we use they are a manifestation from the spiritual world and they choose to serve us no? when three decide i will serve you as a boat and another would say i will become the guardian of this river to protect the water and that's why today we cannot lock the old trees no and we should allow uh, some to grow at the shore of the rivers. This is Saga Narcisa, the female spiritual leader of uh, one of the female spiritual leaders of there are many sagas. And she, uh, we were asking her about water, and she was saying, To us, water is female. So when we mis mistreat, what a woman is mistreating water. So the Kogi came to Central Europe, not only to Westbalde, but they did like around 30 stops around 
Europe. They were brought by Lebendige Zukunft, which is a German organization led by Lukas Buchholz, who wrote a book about the COVID seven years ago. And they decided to come here and also to, to explain the small brothers, so us, how we can remember to manage our environment and to tune with Aluna, with the mother again. So I was very happy to invite them to Everspalde and we organized different events. One event was a colloquium to explain the Cosmovision. Another event was a four hours walk in the woods, in the forest. And it was with 30 people, uh, professors and foresters, German foresters. Uh, and we were tackling questions that for our um, forestry systems at the moment are very crucial, like these storms. What can we do when the storms are uh, really hitting so badly? What can we do to select the new species uh, that we have to plant in our forest to be more resilient for climate change? What can we do with the bark beetle infestations? What, how can we um, treat water or manage water in a more integrative way? So they were, we did some stations and we were stopping to listen to them. They were speaking in their local language and being translated by, by one of them, by Array Voces. And yeah, it was very rich uh, exchange. And I think we were having a lot of camera teams because this will be a documentary that is going to be released uh, shortly. And also it came a lot of, it will come uh, more, more um, newspapers. Yeah, there were a lot of people there. This is the last place, the last stop of our visit in the forest with the Kogi. This is kind of a holy or sacred place that we have here around, where the students come here often. And it was quite impressive this moment, because when we arrived there, um, the Kogi just stopped and was saying, well, some of the replies to our questions about why these storms or why the bark beetle and pests that we are having here in German forest. And for them, it was quite curious and, and very easy to reply. And this is, well, if these trees are not endemic, they are being called by the mother to come back because this is not their place. So mother nature have no problem at all. The problem is us because we depend on these uh, trees, but for the mother, she's just calling the siblings, the children. Um, then what happened in this uh, place? We were there and the mama just said, well, here you have, behind this place, there is a zoo with lions and jaguars and so on. So he said, well, you know that this is a holy place, this is a sacred place, and should not be uh, polluted by all what is in there. And then at this moment, a thumb came, very strongly thumb without frame, but just at only a sound is caught by the cameras. And we were all like, wow, uh, what is this? It was quite striking. And he got nervous, the mamo, because he knows that when a they interpret in their cosmovision that when a thumb is coming, it's like the truth has been told already. It's like the mother has taught, talk. And this is what he said. The message is done. Now it's about you, whether you want to hear and to act. So um, we came back to the university and we it was full uh, here with the president, the decan, the prodecan and more than 200 people came. Uh, so we never saw so full this uh, room in the university. And we were changing more and asking questions. So very rich exchange. What is the second part of this? And I will try to be brief, uh, is my visit to Colombia. I was invited to go there and to 
yeah, together with this team, with the team of Lebendige Zukunft, we, I just came back 10 days ago, that's why it's all very fresh, and that's why I used this presentation to integrate many of the things that I was learning there in this very, very intense adventure. So it was a the team of Lebendige Zukunft, Lukas, Lea, well, all of them uh, amazing people that are going to record, are recording a movie, and it will be released end of this year or beginning next year. And they wanted to record material for doing this movie about how the cooking knowledge could serve our uh, uh, West, West um, development to improve. So we went to amazing places. And one of them was, the first one was this community, which is called Bonga. And just to share with you a few, um, how you call it, curiosities. What, uh, what the cookies do, and this is about the invisible part, the spiritual part. When you arrive to a community, you don't arrive to the community. They will not let you in unless you clean your thoughts. So they have a methodology. They give you a small piece of cotton. And then with this piece of cotton, you have to project all your thoughts and expectations that you put in this place, all your projections, and you project them into the piece of cotton. And then the mammo will clean it separately, the thoughts from the men and from the women, will clean them and we'll bury them into the land to serve as a payment, no? a pagamiento. So you are clean, and then you can get into the community. We were very lucky because we could assist to the council of the COVID. Uh, they have, they, they organize, they are very well organized. This is another type of uh, paradox we think this is another kind of living, but this is very well organized. So every beginning of the year, the mamos uh, from different communities, they gather all together and we were invited to be there, which is quite unique opportunity. And we were telling what we are, uh, what we wanted to do. I was more in charge of researching how and looking how they do their regenerative work with the land. And that's why one day later, we did a um, long, long, exhausting, but beautiful walk to see what is their strategy and how they do with the regeneration of the land. They have been in since decades, uh, Sierra Nevada has been degraded due to the guerrillas and to the crossfire between the militaries and the guerrillas, and it's still there, uh, but they have recovered many places. And one of the first strategies that they do to recover places and to prioritize which places are they going to start regenerating is by looking at the sacred places, the holy places. Here in this picture, minor doesn't look like so special, but if you look at the stone that is down uh, to your to your right, uh, this stone is the stone of regulating the water in this valley. So it's the sacred stone in charge of regulating the harmony and equilibrium of the whole water in the valley. So Maje was talking about the global network and local phenomena. And what the Kogi has is a system of network sacred place that are communicating to each other and that when you regenerate them and bring in and clean, heal them, then this will have like a um, multiplicatory effect in the network so that the balance will be maintained. So for them, the sacred places are their priority. This was a quite a special, very special moment. Uh, it will come in the movie and it will be, it's, it's quite, we did a two hours interview here and 
what they were showing us is the sacred places of this river and how they detect them, the mammoth detect them, and what are the offerings that through the calendar of the year, they do uh, offerings to these uh, sacred places. And here, some of these stones were the sacred place for maintaining the equilibrium of the yucca, of the platano or banana. Uh, and this is how, how they, they detect them. And they, since they are small in this cave, they are being trained by other mammals and they are being trained to see the specific conditions and the specific stones um, that are meaningful for which specific type of living system. And this is what is maintaining the invisible balance of the living system. Yeah, after finishing the walk, they were just taking what they need for doing food, no? which in this case, they just found some um, of these uh, stocks and trunks, and then they took them for the, from the, for the community. Another part that was more, also what I was very interested in, is uh, the female spirituality. What does it mean, the sagas? Most of the people that are going or that are researching the Kogis, they we know um, a lot about the mammoths, about the spiritual leaders, but there is not much known about the sagas, uh, what is their work. And I, I carried a few interviews with the women and it was quite interesting, the views. Uh, it will also come in the movie in a much, much more detailed way. But it's how the importance of collaborating uh, between the mammal and the saga, the female and the male, and this harmony and balancing both uh, uh, to maintain the harmony of the family, to maintain the, fam the harmony of the community. Uh, that is another very important point that is tackling the invisible as well. And is they uh, every day, this for me was like avatar, this was a very impressive moment to see. Every day they gather the children of the community. This is the female, uh, the girls. And in the other side of this big stone is the, the, the youngs, also the, um, the boys. And the mamo and the saga are talking to them and explaining why they should take care of nature, why they should not kill animals, why they should respect water, why they should not get, they should not have uh, so this deep emotional uh, or, or this ira or this, because this could harm nature. So they receive this education, informal education every day. Apart from cleaning the thoughts when you arrive, they do this type of education. Yeah, and then at the end they get uh, a piece of cotton, and this is like the writing room, also the cleaning uh, of the emotional states every day. And if it could not be uh, much in the nights, they also gather together, and this was another special moment. So I have a lot of these special moments uh in which they gather together and what they do is to solve conflicts in a communal way so males females with a lot of babies and this is the point uh, i i forgot to tell you one of the most striking aspects that i saw is life 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 in all forms and so they gather together and they solve problems together um, So let me go to the very last part. We have one hour together and this is short and is the integration and is the balance. You look at is how they call the balance between the visible and invisible, female, male. And for this, I have to remember you this graph from Carol Sanford, the seven principles of regeneration. And these are my take, take home message from the integration between the Kogi and the regenerative approach. 
So the Kugi have one thought, and it's a Luna, and it's that they are, there is no separation with nature. There is not a relation with nature. They are nature. Yeah. So automatically they are trained in all this training that I show you, formal, informal, they clean themselves to see clearly every day that there is no separation, that they are nature and whatever happened in nature is happening to them. So going to the whole and to the nestedness, as I told you, they, they don't relate to nature, they are nature. And when they have to see the essence and the potential, uh, the essence and potential of a place is not dictated by them or by their minds, it's dictated by the mother, by nature. So when they regenerate a place, they don't decide. They ask the mother what it is here, and the mother will tell them. So it's not this arrogant view in which we know what in this soil will come next. The mother will decide, and we will co-create with the mother. So the next is uh, in this developmental world, they don't develop themselves as an individual only. They develop as a community because they believe in the power that the individual needs to be uh, strength, but the, no change can be durable if we don't do it as a community. And this is again the nested systems, but in the social aspects. Nodal interventions to, to develop and unfold essence and potentials, these nodal interventions are being channeled. So there is a communication, continuous communication between the mammals, the sagas, the nature, so they are like the bridges, the nature and, um, and the community. And the fields is like they, they identify the sacred places, they clean them, they connect all sacred places in these networks of localities, and in the end, they carry on a mutualism type of relationship with all the sacred places. They give and receive. If, uh, they, if there is a problem in, with amphibians, they know where is the sacred place of the amphibian and they would go there to repair whatever problem might be happening there. No? So this uh, spiritual work and energetic work is underpinning all the external world continuously. This mutualism of giving and receiving is being maintained in a continuous way. And here I just led you with questions um, that I'm asking myself and that now is like the part of my work is like how could we see in our landscapes uh, again, how can we see our landscape as a whole again? No? How can we train our eyes, our senses to see all as a living system? How can we communicate with the mother? What is the voice of the mother? So that I'm not working with my small mind telling uh, I know what the soil needs. Eh? No. How can I talk to the mother as uh, the cookies and co-create with nature all the time? No? How can we, how could we identify what sacred places, how, how could we heal them from history? How could we maintain this mutual giving and receiving in our Western world, in which we are only asking, asking and asking, for example, no? How can we do payments in the sense of I, this giving and receiving? Is payments a good uh, way for us in this world? And another question is how could we introduce our emotional and thought cleaning practices in our families, in our communities, and as an individual. So I have thousands of more questions, and maybe you also. And I thank you, yeah, your presence, your ears, a lot. And yeah, I wish it has provided you with some insights and motivations, as it did to me as well. Thank you. Thank you.